Think Forward. Think Research Channel. years ago today, the U.S. Patent Office here in Washington issued a patent number, 174465. It went to an inventor, a Scotsman who was developing a technology that would allow him to communicate with his deaf mother and with a deaf woman that he was courting. Three days after Alexander Graham Bell received his patent for the telephone and he returned to his Boston laboratory, he shouted these now famous words to his assistant after spilling battery acid over himself. Mr. Watson, come here. I need you. Nothing speaks louder to our current crisis and in innovation. As a nation, we are best in the world at invention and scientific exploration. We are the very icons of risk-taking, social progress, and economic success. At the University of Michigan alone, our scientists discovered the genes for cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease, and our alumni are responsible for the iPod and Google. But we have a problem. Many of you here have seen the latest studies and the publicized the ominous findings. The best minds in our country, business leaders like Norm Augustine of Lockheed Martin and Rick Wagoner of GM, university presidents like Shirley Tillman of Princeton and John Hennessy of Stanford, are profoundly concerned that we are now at risk as a nation if we do not commit to more innovation, more math and science, and more basic research. As a contributor to these reports, I can only echo the alarms being rung by the National Academies, the Council on Competitiveness, and the country's leading manufacturers, and strongly reinforce their recommendations for deeper research funding, stronger high school curricula, and greater investment in financial support for our students. Yet my concern is tempered by the resolve of America's research universities. We prepare the people who solve the problems of the world. As leaders in engineering, medicine, and science, it's time we turn to one another and like Bell to Watson said, I need you. We excel at creating solutions for our future, and I believe that by drawing on our vast and unique strengths, and reaching outside our tra traditional academic comfort zones, our universities will continue to be the backbone of American innovation. I want to talk to you today from three vantage points that allow me really to see the challenges that we face and, I, and the solutions that I believe are out there. First, I'm a scientist with more than 20 years experience in the laboratory. Second, I'm the resident of a manufacturing state enveloped by deep economic crisis. And third, I'm president of one of the world's great public research universities. Like many of my peers who lead research institutions, I came of age with Sputnik and the space race. I really find it hard to believe sometimes that it's been 45 years since President Kennedy issued his call to put a man on the moon because of the enthusiasm and the energy that it produced in so many people like me and in me. And that's still a very distinct feeling. Getting into space and to the moon was an obsession. It was really an absolute obsession. There was the science, of course. But more importantly, there was the Soviet Union. America's love competition. And here was our number one enemy, communists, already sending men into orbit. JFK was going to beat them, and every aspiring scientist in America, lump, young people like me, became enthralled with the power and the promise of science. And when we did. And now the generation that couldn't get enough of engineering and medicine and math is at the helm of leadership saying, we need another Sputnik. But today's crisis cannot be compared to Sputnik because this is not your father's space race. We have no enemy, except perhaps ourselves. Our national priorities are not necessarily shared priorities, as any observer of Congress or American culture, for that matter, knows. 
There's not a whole lot that we can rally behind together as a society, except perhaps who should be the next American Idol. And I wanted to show this, because I think it's pretty, it's pretty uh, em emblematic of what we face, a recent USA Today that has the Grammy Awards up above the fold and the uh, falling behind in the global brain race below the fold. It's pretty emblematic of our tenuous position as a leader in science and technology. As a nation, we absolutely must put more emphasis on brains than we do Bruce and Beyonce. It's not just brains, it's brain power. Putting a man on the moon, frankly, was easier than finding a cure for AIDS or a solution to global warming. Today's challenges are incredibly complex and they require creativity and expertise of many great minds. That's how we have to approach science today because the problems we need to solve are too complicated to be explained by the lone scientist in the solitary lab. This is not to say the desire to be innovative, indeed the very need, comes without complications. If the space race was a battle cry, today's push to be innovative can just be a battle. Let me give you an example. The state of Michigan is, of course, home to the auto industry. Our heritage is in manufacturing, and we are proud of our contributions to the American and the world economies because of the vehicles and the spin-off technologies we design and build. But we are undergoing dramatic transformation in our state. No longer can children grow up knowing that a well-paying job with benefits awaits them at the local assembly plant. No longer do mid-level managers plan careers and devote loyalties to one company. And no longer do executives fret only about next year's model, but the next decade's health care and pensions costs. The state of Michigan is being forced to reinvent an economy built on innovation. Balance this with what's happening on our campus at the University of Michigan. Over the past six years, we have invested $1 billion and nearly a million square feet of new space to life sciences research, education, and we hope economic development. That investment includes stem cell research. I am a strong believer in the scientific importance of stem cells and the great promise they hold in developing life-saving medical treatments of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and other debilitating ailments. And our scientists, experts in such wide-ranging fields as genetics, cell biology, cancer research, and biomedical engineering, are working together to explore this new science. But our efforts are being choked because of incredibly tight state restrictions on embryonic stem cell research. Our investments in science, technology, and a retooled Michigan economy, our investments are at risk if scientists in our state cannot pursue promising avenues of research. We're going to lose our best scientists to other states where the research climate is more favorable, and there is no good in that for Michigan, the university, or the state. That's what I mean by this not being the same kind of brain race as Sputnik. Even with new discoveries before us, new discoveries, that mean new technologies, new jobs. We sometimes face resistance and skepticism that the Mercury 7 never encountered. I've mentioned living in Michigan, and one of the, mis the, the great features of our state is the Detroit Pistons basketball team. They're remarkable. Not because of one star, they have no Shaq, no LeBron, but because of talented individuals who come together to find the best way to succeed. There's something magical about team building. Now I know that there's a world of difference between the NBA and DNA, but the model of the Pistons is spot on because it demonstrates the remarkable energy of collaboration. And collaboration means power. It does not mean sacrificing leadership, it means enhancing it. And universities as leaders must go anywhere to make that happen. This summer, a delegation from the University of Michigan visited China. It caused me to reflect not so long ago that we as Americans were told we never had to worry about China or Asia 
because their educational systems could never match the creativity of ours. How wrong. Two weeks in Beijing and Shanghai were plenty to show me how tremendously creative and committed the Chinese are to research and to science. Now, as a university, we didn't travel to China to check out the competition, but to find ways to work together with our colleagues at places like Beijing Normal University, Shanghai Xiaotong, Renmin, and Fudan universities. We can learn from them, and they can learn from us, and in the end, our students, tomorrow's leaders, will be better prepared because of the alliances we create. There is so much potential in these partnerships. Now consider this. We're going to work with the Chinese to screen genomics of thousands of chemical compounds found in traditional Chinese herbal medicine. We want to identify their properties and their usefulness for pharmaceuticals. This is a massive undertaking involving many scientists all working together to unlock the mysteries of medicines that millions have turned to over the centuries. There are bound to be active compounds there. Our alliances also extend to the social sciences, and I think this is where we're going to see the real test of Chinese higher education and its role in their society. And it's where Michigan, as, a Michigan, as an American research university, can be a model for innovation. Our researchers are establishing a program in quantitative social science research with Peking University. Together, our universities are going to conduct surveys of two Chinese provinces with a combined population of 150 million people. Nothing like this ever before has happened in China. And I think it will be telling to see how the Chinese government responds to what is on the minds of its people. By reaching out and finding strong partners, we as a university can create amazing work that will transform the world. Our alliances can and should extend beyond academic and geographic borders, and Michigan is doing that with our immense research library. In allowing Google to digitize seven million books of our library, we're inviting anyone with an internet connection to seek knowledge. We're one of several universities involved in this project, and it's an educator's dream knowing that the vast information held in the libraries of Michigan, Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, and the New York Public Library will be universally searchable, and in the case of public domain works, accessible. At the same time, by digitizing today's books through our own efforts on campus and in partnership with others, we're protecting the written word for all time. The University of Michigan could have done this project alone, but our librarian said it would take a thousand years, and that wasn't very practical. With Google's technology, it will happen in six years. The decision was an obvious one. It's about social good, promoting knowledge and sharing it, and we're happy to have such a strong collaborator and making it a reality. Now, this isn't to say we don't have critics. Disruptive technologies and new ideas can generate scary reactions and burdensome restrictions. Like the science of stem cells, the technology of digitizing books and making them searchable is generating resistance to the point of litigation. But we cannot afford to be short-sighted about discoveries that may well provide new models for business and scholarship. We absolutely cannot limit our vision. As with stem cells, I believe digitizing books provides tremendous opportunities for publishers, for authors, for libraries, and for students. It is a pioneering endeavor that is about the very ideal of a great university. And it is the great universities of this country which will see us through this crisis in innovation and competitiveness. It is our responsibility to respond, and we are very good at creating answers to tomorrow's questions. Very good. Universities are places of deep exploration and bold experimentation. At last count, university researchers in this country were filing invention disclosures at the rate of nearly two an hour, every day of every week. Great ideas are born on our campuses. Hewlett Packard was born at a university, as was the artificial heart, the integrated circuit chip, 
and yes, Google. We must now turn to each other and to potential partners in the corporate world, in government, and to the startup company down the street, and say, let's find a way to make it happen. Collaboration is our future. Whether we pull together scientists from opposite ends of our campus or opposite sides of the country, we must call on our best people to develop solutions for the future. Now, academe has this uh, saying, publish or perish, and I say, partner or perish. Last month, engineers at Michigan announced they've developed a new cochlear implant that has potential to provide remarkable sound for the profoundly deaf. More than 100,000 people have chosen this technology over the years, but earlier versions have their limitations. There was a nice piece in Science Times today in the New York Times about the challenge. They can be difficult for surgeons to implant, and the sound they deliver is less than perfect. For example, patients can often recognize the spoken word with a cochlear implant, but they can't discern musical notes. The new device that we've just announced and developed is dramatic development. Not only is it ribbon thin and more adaptable to the intricate workings of the human ear, it provides greater frequency range and up to eight times better frequency resolution. If you have a hearing problem or if you had bad eyesight, an eight-fold improvement will help you understand why we're so excited about this announcement. You know, but Michigan researchers didn't do this alone. The new technology is a product of a joint research adventure of the University of Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan Technological University, and the National Science Foundation. We're bringing together the best institutions to create the brightest technologies. And we have gone from Alexander Graham Bell's desire to transmit sound to the roar of Saturn rockets hurtling to the moon. And now we have a tiny device with the potential to deliver Bruce, Beyonce, or Beethoven. That's the sound of innovation and collaboration, and it will reverberate for generations. So I thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Have you heard any criticism from members of your faculty or publish offers on this? Um, you know, our faculty are overwhelmingly positive about this. Uh, they see, I certainly think that they are very attuned to the idea that, uh, you know, one of the functions of libraries is to preserve the written word, and they see this as a way to preserve the written word. Faculty who have become uh, more intimately involved in some of the projects, the ancillary projects that we have going along with this, have been enthusiastic uh, promoters of the project. I, I can give, give you just one example. We have a project that we did ourselves, that is before the Google uh, uh, arrangement came along, uh, called The Making of America, and or I Imagining America, I guess it is. And it was, we took uh, uh, books and uh, original materials that were published in a period from about 1830 to 1860, and we digitized them and made them completely searchable on the web. And what we've discovered by making those materials now available is that we're getting huge demand for them uh, from people who didn't even know they existed. And, and the best example I've got is a book that was published, I think it was in 1854, I'm not exactly sure of the date, but it's about the art of beekeeping. And it's turned out to be the Bible of modern beekeeping because what was known in 1854 about cultivating bees is was good then, it's good today. So, so people are beginning to see that, that books long lost uh, from the public view can now be, now be uh, searched and found, and, uh, uh, and, and it's great. And I, as, as our librarians you know, have said many times, we've believed in this forever. You know, we think this is extraordinarily important. Now, uh, we do have our critics, and uh, I think uh, many authors and publishers are worried that this will somehow uh, take away from from their from their profits. We I actually see it as a way to sell more books and to enhance. Pro it's a new business model. It's not one that we're accustomed to, but I absolutely believe that it will make works out of print, works that people have forgotten about, uh, accessible. And when you have millions and billions of eyeballs <laughs> searching for something, then you have a much more likely. Uh, opportunity, I think, you know, to 
fill a need and sell a book. I, I just would like to have a perspective on the University of Michigan's, I guess, program and how you've restructured, if necessary, for the new thrust for the engineering and math program. And if you could provide maybe a percentage of the overall number of students, those who are foreign and women, if you have a perspective, mm -hmm. if you can. Sure. Um, the University of Michigan is about 50-50 men and women, uh, maybe edging slightly up to 51%, but it's pretty even. Uh, international students, we, uh, we have about somewhere between four and 5,000 on the campus. Uh, we're a pretty high percentage for uh, a big research public university, and it's been, you know, it's, we really were concerned uh, right after 9-11 because our applications from international students went dropped precipitously because of the visa problems. The State Department has been working hard on that and that's much improved now and so our application numbers are rebounding. We didn't ever see the drop in, in people who actually came but it was the, we, we didn't feel like that we were getting the right uh, exposure in terms of the numbers of applicants. Um, we're doing many things to try to encourage and bring collaboration down to the undergraduate level. You know, we do it well in graduate education. People work together, big lab groups work together. They, scientists uh, cross this chasm and, and, and work on problems together. Uh, we've just initiated a project at the university to challenge our faculty to come up with some good ideas for interdisciplinary courses. I've put several million dollars into this. And what I'd most like to do is to get faculty to think about topics that could be uh, looked at from a number of different perspectives. Let's say that if you were, that if you were, had a topic that was uh, dealing with an international issue where you might want to look at it from a historical perspective, a cultural perspective, a language perspective, uh, uh, you know, a current topics perspective. And I really want to stimulate this sort of team teaching approach in, in the undergraduate level. The other thing that we've done at Michigan and we've had in place for many years, and I think it's been highly successful, mm -hmm. is an undergraduate research opportunity experience. We have several thousand students each year who go into laboratories, they go into libraries with professors. Uh, they work in big teams um, on, in, in certain areas, and that's available to freshmen. So we've discovered that you want, we want to harness that energy and get young people in the lab right away because they, they sometimes, as a scientist myself, I know that sometimes it's the naive and very bright student who asks the question that causes you to think about your topic in a completely new way, and they can be among the most innovative sparks that you have in the, la in the lab, and so you don't want to lose that energy. I just wanted to ask you if you have any relationships in India also, just like with the Chinese universities. In fact, we do. I know you're probably familiar with one of our most famous professors, C.K. Prahalad, who has uh, uh, talked about the bottom of the pyramid and how it's so important for companies to provide goods and services for the, uh, those among the most poor, the, the, the very lowest economic status, because they have desires too, and they have buying power, and they will be able to participate in the economy as they move up the economic ladder, and it's a, it's a group not to be, not to be ignored. Uh, our business school has very good relationships in, uh, in India, and in fact has some programs uh, there uh, in, in Bangalore, and uh, they're only growing stronger. So it's another area that's extremely important to us. Best relationships are probably with the business school now in India. During the Sputnik era, uh, Russia was our enemy. Right. Um, in thinking about the critics of stem cells or the critics of the Google project today, should we think of those people as the enemy that need to be overcome for the greater good? Because they, I, I don't know if that would, they are the ones encouraging you to want to be competitive mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah. where do you see them in the framework? Yeah. No, you know, I don't view anybody as the real enemy here. Uh, it, it, it's a complexity because, you know, I remember growing up, the, the, it's hard to, uh, I mean, that time of Sputnik was one where there was so much shared uh, national purpose. And it was absolutely clear. And, you know, the astronauts were the, were the superstars. Every school ch child knew. And it was all about, you know, 
winning this race. And so it didn't face the, the sort of culture wars or, or, or real differences in opinion that I think we face now. I know that many people have a disagreement about stem cell research. What I find that's very interesting, and I do think it's the responsibility of educators like me, is to go out and educate people about what stem cells mean and what they don't, doesn't mean. And that one of the things I find is that when people hear and they understand that you can conduct this research in a highly ethical way, that some of their fears actually dissolve. And, and I want to give you just a little story because this is one that I, we were at a session and talking to a group of people and, and, and a mother actually brought this up to me as a, as a sort of an anal you know, a story about how to explain this. And I thought it was, it's her words, but it was really very, very good. And she, she, what she said was that, that she was trying to understand the Michigan law. And she said, do you mean that I and my husband, if we had a child who was dying, and we, and we wanted to donate that child's organs so that somebody else could live, that we can do that, that that's legal. But if I, if I go to an uh, in vitro fertilization clinic, and I, we make you know hundreds of embryos, and half of them are defective, and you cannot use them in a, they have to be destroyed, you cannot ethically implant them, that my husband and I can't donate those to save somebody's life. And I said, yes, that's the problem. And so that puts it in a context, I think, that people don't, some people don't think about. And so my responsibility is to go out and to help educate people about what we're talking about, what we're not talking about, why uh, adult stem cells don't have the capacity of embryonic stem cells, and while adult stem cells may be useful, they do not have the full scientific potential of embryonic. So I don't want to view anybody as an enemy. I'd much rather try to find ways to educate and collaborate. And, uh, and you know, sometimes uh, two, two, two values uh, come in conflict. I think in the whole issue of the Google project, the public has some rights. I mean, copyright was, it, was, was, was designed to get information disseminated to the public. So the authors don't have all the rights here, and the publishers don't have all the rights. We have some rights as the public, and we need to exert those rights. Now, ultimately, the courts will decide, but I think that there is a one, I mean, I think we have a lot of, uh, of, of good argument on the side of the public. Uh, and we know that over the centuries, that beginning with the great libraries of Alexandria, you know, the notion that, that, that the written word is, is, is not in danger, yeah, I mean, it is in danger. Fi libraries burn down, collections get lost due to war and all kinds of bad things. And I think preservation of the written word is one of the very important parts of this project as well. It's part of a social good.